muted. Welcome everyone to today's program. I'm Heather Punky with Becker's Hospital with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during this time. You will receive an email within a, about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time, but the email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Linda Homan is the Senior Manager of Clinical and Professional Services for Ecolab Healthcare. In that role, Linda focuses on the development of clinical and educational solutions, applied clinical research, and incorporation of clinical best practices in all healthcare offerings. Linda is board certified in infection control and active in the field for over 20 years. She has held leadership positions in APC, including President and Vice President of the Minnesota Chapter and Board Member of the National APIC Research, Research Council, formerly the APIC Research, Research Foundation. Linda has participated in the development of infection control and environmental hygiene guidelines for the state of Minnesota and for AAD, and has often presented on topics related to infection prevention and control at regional and national APIC, AORN, and AHE meetings. And we have Don Hughes, who is a senior executive with more than 15 years of leadership experience and 25 years of overall nursing experience in hospitals, ranging from a 25-bed critical access facility to a large academic hospital with more than 900 beds. Her, her experience includes various leadership roles in hospitals, including executive oversight of up to 15 services. She is a results-focused leader with proven ability to identify and resolve problems, control costs, maximize productivity, engage staff, and meet all regulatory requirements. She brings a unique skill set that includes leading large organizations with more than 300 FTEs while also being able to train staff RNs on proper techniques and procedure areas. Selected accomplishments include performance turnaround, regulatory compliance, materials management, standardization and reduction, and shared governance. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Linda to begin today's presentation. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us and we're going to talk about evidence for easily improving OR environmental hygiene. And here are the learner objectives that we've put together for this presentation. We're going to describe the role of environmental contamination in the transmission of healthcare associated infections. We'll discuss the latest research on environmental hygiene. We'll list some processes and tools that are in place today to improve environmental hygiene. And last, we'll discuss the results of a pilot program that improved environmental hygiene in the operating room while uh, decreasing room turnover time. So first to set the stage a little bit and talk about the role of the environment in the operating room and in healthcare in general. This is a study that was done by HOTA in 2004 and it shows um, various pathogens that are of interest in healthcare with bacteria at the top and viruses at the bottom. And what they found in, in their study is they looked at how long these various pathogens survive on surfaces and they found that C. difficile, which is a huge concern for all of us in healthcare today, survives for up to over five months on environmental surfaces. Staph, which is um, also MRSA, can survive up to seven months, VRE four months, Acinetobacter five months, and then on down through virus, or the viruses, which also survive for weeks to months on environmental surfaces if they aren't removed by proper environmental hygiene. And so obviously um, environmental hygiene has a huge impact on um, healthcare associated infections and that happens because patients with pathogens contaminate the environment and the surfaces near them and then those um, contaminated surfaces become a source for healthcare workers to contaminate their hands or gloves and then those contaminated environmental surfaces can contribute to the spread of HAIs. And a very interesting study that was done in 2011 really highlights uh, the interconnectedness of the environment and patient skin. And so this was looking at the contamination of hands with MRSA after contact with environmental surfaces and after contact with the skin of colonized patients. And this, in this study, they found that hand contamination was equally likely after contact with environmental surfaces as it was with skin sites. Um, and that's a very important thing to note. So the black bars on the graph on the left are really showing the total uh, positive handprint culture results um, for both skin and the environment. 
the graph on the right is showing that not only were they equally likely to be contaminated, there was no significant difference in the number of colony forming units that were found on gloved hands after contact with the skin and environmental surfaces. So they were equally likely to be as contaminated um, from touching the surfaces as they were from touching skin. And so that really highlights that whole um, chain of infection and the, the interconnectedness of hands um, and environmental surfaces in healthcare. And so I want to talk a little bit about what the, some more of the latest evidence that supports the need for environmental hygiene in the operating room in particular. This is a list of concepts that have studies that support them and probably in the last 10 years there's been just a lot of research done on the importance of the environment. And if, as you read across here it tells a story saying that previously contaminated rooms increase the risk of transmission, many patient areas are not well cleaned, and that if you do monitoring and feedback with a fluorescent marker or some other type of objective environmental monitoring program, you can improve the cleaning of high touch objects and that improved cleaning will decrease environmental contamination and most importantly of all if you improve cleaning you're going to decrease the acquisition of pathogens by patients and so I'd like to just show you one study um, that supports each one of these concepts and the first one is that previously contaminated rooms uh, that rooms are contaminated and so this was a really sentinel study that was done by Dr. Carling and a group of infection preventionists from around the country and they looked at multiple sites in hospitals, in operating rooms, in ICUs, in chemotherapy clinics, in long-term care and dialysis, and they found that on average about 30% of high-touch objects were cleaned. So they looked at high-touch object cleaning in all of those different settings. And you'll notice that in the operating room they had 16 different sites where they looked at thoroughness of cleaning and their average came in just a little bit over 30 percent for operating room cleaning. And so that was really the very first study that was done that showed how well or not well surfaces are cleaned um, in the in healthcare. And then this was a second study that was done specifically for the operating room. This was by Julie Jefferson and colleagues. Um, and they looked at six different hospitals in the operating rooms in six different hospitals and they found an average of 25% of high-touch objects were cleaned in the operating room. Um, and they also found that the use of a fluorescent marker led to a significant improvement in cleaning. Um, but th this is sort of setting the baseline and what we talk about when we talk to people in the operating room about thoroughness of cleaning is that on average when we go around the country and look at how well high-touch objects are being cleaned, it's generally about 25% of high touch objects and we'll have some other um, examples of that further on in the presentation. This was a really interesting study done by Mark Rupp that looked at time as a measure of thoroughness of cleaning. You would assume that the longer you take to clean the better the cleaning would be but this study really shows that that isn't necessarily the case. You can see by this scatter plot that there really is no correlation between time and percent of surfaces cleaned. So in fact there's one person who cleaned uh, 50% of high touch objects in 10 minutes on the far left and then there's another person who cleaned um, only about 20 or 25% of high touch objects and it took them over an hour to clean that many and so there really isn't um, in, unless you have a really good process in place uh, this is a pretty uncontrolled process today and there really isn't a good correlation between the time spent cleaning and the thoroughness of cleaning at least in this particular setting so the next thing that I wanted to talk about is that improved cleaning decreases environmental contamination and we talked a little bit about that with the study I showed you with skin and environment but this was a specifically a study that was done in the operating room so Dr. Munoz Price uh, did this in a very large uh, hospital and published this data in 2012 and she looked at decreasing operating room pathogen contamination through improved cleaning practice and so they wanted to see what the impact of a an cleaning and educational intervention would have not only on how well they cleaned high touch objects but the recovery of gram negative bacilli from environmental surfaces and you can see from this graph that um, at the baseline they had 47 percent of high touch objects cleaned and they had 10.7 percent uh, recovery of gram negative bacilli from environmental surfaces they put uh, an education and cleaning intervention in place that included the use of the daso fluorescent marker along with some good training on how to clean the operating room and they were able to decrease the number of gram negative bacilli recovered from surfaces to 2.3 percent when their high touch object cleaning went to 82 percent and so a really nice easy way to see that 
as we would like to assume, if you do a better job cleaning, your surfaces will be cleaner. And I would just say that that's all well and good, but the most important thing is what's the impact that this have on our, has on our patients? Because at the end of the day, if the surfaces are cleaner but it doesn't really have an impact on patient outcomes, it's not as important. And so the last one, the last study that I want to talk about is something that shows that improved cleaning decreases the acquisition of pathogens. And so that study is um, done by data. This was published in 2011, and they looked at the acquisition of multidrug resistant organisms after improved cleaning. They looked in 10 different ICUs, and they used a targeted feedback mechanism using the DASO fluorescent marker, cleaning cloths that were saturated with a disinfectant, and increased education. And they wanted to see what the impact of that was on the acquisition of MRSA and VRE um, for patients who had a prior room occupant that had that organism. And they found um, that as their thoroughness of cleaning improved, their uh, acquisition of MRSA and VRE decreased. And so you can see on the graph on the right that pre-intervention, they had a uh, pretty much equal number of thoroughness of cleaning and MRSA and VRE contamination. After the intervention, 71% of high-touch objects were cleaned and uh, Oh, I think I'm reading that wrong. But at any rate, they decreased acquisition of MRSA and VRE significantly during the study. And so it had a big impact on patient outcomes. And that's really the holy grail. That's really what we're looking for um, when we're doing any kind of intervention is can we have an impact on the outcomes for the patient. And so because this evidence is growing and because um, all of our guidelines and associations these days are trying to to be evidence-based. If you look at the APIC guidelines, the AORN guidelines, the CDC guidelines, they're all focusing on evidence-based decision-making. And because we've had all these studies that have been done in the last 10 years on the importance of the environment and the impact of cleaning on patient outcomes, um, some of our standard-setting organizations and guidelines have started to move in the direction of talking about improving thoroughness of cleaning and monitoring thoroughness of cleaning. And the first uh, guideline that came out that discussed that was the CDC toolkit. It's called Options for Evaluating Environmental Hygiene. The URL for a link for that guideline or that toolkit is down at the bottom of the slide. And this toolkit really focused on um, cleaning high-touch objects, um, providing an, ep an objective method to evaluate the thoroughness of cleaning, um, providing continuous feedback that can drive focused training, because if you don't provide feedback, um, processes don't change. And then be, the ability to provide reports so that you can document process and share it with leadership. And so this is a really, um, really a sentinel important guideline that was written and one that many other organizations have followed. So for example, the Association of Perioperative Nurses updated their guideline for perioperative practices for environmental cleaning in 2015. And they have a focus now on cleaning of high touch surfaces. And they have some detailed um, instructions on which high touch objects to clean under which circumstances. And that's what the graphic on the right is showing. This is a, an AORN environmental cleaning toolkit that's available on their website. Um, that's there for anyone to take a look at and download. So I highly recommend you take a look at that. And then the other association that also up, up, updated their guidelines was the uh, Association for the Healthcare Environment. And so in 2012, they included a chapter on environmental monitoring in their practice guidance for the healthcare environmental cleaning. And so as you can see, um, government agencies and professional associations are starting to recommend uh, and recognize the importance of environmental hygiene and the importance of monitoring how well cleaning is being done in an objective way. So I want to talk then a little bit about monitoring environmental cleaning because that really is one of the best practices that's out there today. Um, this is again a table that came from the CDC toolkit, Options for Evaluating Environmental Hygiene, and they look at the five different methods. It's actually four methods if you combine the two culture methods into one type the five different methods for monitoring environmental hygiene. And they look at them in terms of ease of use, their ability to identify pathogens, how useful they are for individual teaching, whether they can be used to directly evaluate cleaning, and whether their um, use has been published in peer-reviewed journals to show a programmatic improvement. And so you can see by looking at these various methods that uh, some are have stronger body of evidence than others. 
um, swab cultures and auger slide cultures are really uh, effective at identifying specific pathogens, but they have limitations in terms of the turnaround time, the 48-hour turnaround time that's required to identify to get the results, and also the cost and the resources that are required from your hospital laboratory. And so cultures are really reserved for outbreak situations and situations in which you really need to know specifically what pathogens are growing on surfaces or what organisms are growing on surfaces. Um, and they're really not designed or intended to be used to, to monitor the thoroughness of cleaning. Um, I want to talk a little bit about C. difficile spores because that is such a hot topic today. It's something that everyone is thinking about. And as you're looking at environmental monitoring methods, you're going to want to make sure that whatever method you choose is going to meet the needs that, that you have in mind. And so the thing to know about C. difficile is that in its spore form, C. difficile is metabolically dormant. Um, it does not produce ATP. And ATP is the method by which um, which is adenosine triphosphate, is the method by which ATP technology um, identifies the amount of organic material on surfaces. And so because a spore doesn't form um, ATP because it's dormant, the ATP technology is not going to register the presence of uh, C. difficile spores on surfaces. Um, fluorescent marker, on the other hand, has been shown to correlate very well with removal of bacteria and C. difficile spores because it's measuring whether or not a surface was physically cleaned and it's correlated well with C. diff removal. This was a study that was done by Dr. Rutala and his colleagues, and they presented it at APIC in 2013, and they did a comparison of the different monitoring methods um, in both medical, surgical, pediatric ICU, and non-ICU settings. They really looked at culture as the gold standard, and they compared these different methods. And as you can see by looking at this, culture um, was accurate 90 over 90% of the time, as you would expect. I think it was something like 98% of the time. It really is the best way to know how much and what um, and then what kind of bacteria and pathogens might be growing on your surface. Fluorescent marker was the second most accurate in terms of identifying or correlating well with the amount of bacteria removed on the surface, followed by visual observation and then by ATP. And then as a next step then, when you're thinking about best practices and ways to improve cleaning in the operating room or in any setting, there are a lot of new tools and processes that are out there today. And I want to touch a little bit on what some of those are so that you can be thinking about incorporating them into your practice. The first thing is microfiber, and many hospitals are using microfiber today in some part of the hospital. In this case in particular, disposable microfiber really when, lends itself well to use in the operating room. Um, it increases productivity because it carries, it holds up to seven times its weight uh, of disinfectant on it, and so it can clean many surfaces um, and release onto many surfaces. So you might need fewer cloths to clean a room, especially compared to maybe some of the wipes that are available today. Um, superior cleaning performance, again, because of its large surface area, it has a very rough surface and so it picks up a lot of um, debris and a lot of organisms and a lot of um, organic material on surfaces. It's really effective for cleaning all kinds of surfaces and it's very low linting, which is important in the operating room. It's also considered to be sustainable because you can reduce the chemical usage because of the amount of water that's carried. Um, on each cloth and the amount of solution on each cloth. So microfiber is a really good uh, thing for you to consider using in the operating room if you're using something else today, such as cotton cloths or, uh, or wipers. Cleaning carts are also uh, another thing that you might ha not have thought about. They're there and you probably just don't focus on them very much. But there are carts out today that are very efficient, that set up uh, and make sure that you have everything ready and available at the point of use, which is very important, especially if you're trying to save time between cases. And so this particular cart is set up so that you put all the mops and cloths that you're going to use for the day into the cart. You saturate them with the right amount of chemistry so they're not oversaturated or undersaturated. And then you, you have this cart near you at the point of use and you just take out what you need and use it. At the end of the day, you don't have a lot of extra chemistry or water to dump down the drain and everything is easy to use and close to use. 
And the sweep set is another thing that people don't maybe think about too much, but I go into a lot of operating rooms and see that they're still using straw brooms. And as we know, we don't want to aerosolize. Um, and using a straw broom is really not a good way to prevent aerosolization, aerosolization of dust and other particles into the air. So a sweep set like the one in the picture here is really a good um, a good solution because it works kind of like the squeegee that you use to clean your windows at the gas station. It has a, a really good ability to pick things up off the floor and then you sweep them right into the, the dust container that's shown there. It's also really easy to clean. You can just wipe it down after you use it um, as opposed to a straw broom, which is pretty impossible to clean really. And then I wouldn't be, uh, it would be remiss if I didn't talk about process controls. Uh, thinking about the operating room, it, it's a process that's very well defined and it lends itself well to the use of different um, Lean Six Sigma or HACCP or other process improvement methodologies. Lean Six Sigma is something that we incorporate into programs that we have for the operating room and it's really able to look at um, process simplification and standardization, which is a really big need in the operating room, and also looking at efficiency and the sustainability of the savings that you can find. So uh, incorporating Lean Six Sigma is a really good way to think about improving any process in the operating room. Uh, another, another process control that we talk about at Ecolab is hazard analysis critical control points. And what that's doing is really looking at every possible input into a process and looking at every way that that process can go wrong and then putting uh, methods in place to mitigate whatever that thing is that can go wrong so that you can ensure a consistent desired outcome. Of course, you want to always incorporate best practices from professional associations and standard setting organizations. And you have to have some way to objectively evaluate whether the process your improvements you're putting in place are being effective. And so that's another very important thing. And so consider incorporating process controls into any improvement project that you're going to do. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about some best practices and some pilot studies that we've done looking at improving both um, room turnover time and that's that period of time where we're focusing um, where we're focusing our attention is really on that period of time from wheels out when the patient leaves to room ready to open for the next case so it's that period of time when the room is being turned over and cleaned um, and so we have been able to um, reduce OR turnover times and improve operating room cleanliness with this program that we've put together and so I want to tell you a little bit about that now and some of the results that we've had with that. The first and very important thing is monitoring and reporting. So we've spent some time talking already about the importance of monitoring and this is no exception in the operating room. You need to monitor the thoroughness of cleaning and so we use a fluorescent marker, the DAZO fluorescent marker um, and all the tools that go with that including uh, online reporting and the capability to have reports generated and sent to you automatically. Um, and that's to make sure that the, after you've done training that you're monitoring and making sure that the high touch objects are being cleaned effectively. We have cleaning protocols which are very important. You have to standardize the process and we worked closely um, with best practices that have been developed by AORN and others to make sure and in fact AORN in some cases to make sure that we had the best practices and the best protocols in place and the training that we provide um, for room turnover cleaning is has the AORN seal of recognition. We not only train people but we do staff coaching so we're literally working side by side with people to make sure that they are comfortable with how to clean a room, how to turn it over, how to prevent cross-contamination, and how to do it in the most efficient way possible. And so it's not just uh, training, it's actually side-by-side -side working with people and coaching them on how to do the cleaning. And then of course it always includes the cleaning products and some of the things that I talked about that are going to improve efficiency. We incorporate Lean Six Sigma type tech methodology. We monitor the thoroughness of cleaning. We monitor the room turnover time and we measure to see that we've been able to show an improvement. And then of course we have cleaning products, chemistry, microfiber, carts and all the things that go with it. And so all together when you put this program together and you provide some careful monitoring and feedback, you can have really good results by decreasing room turnover times while improving the thoroughness of cleaning. And the first example we have of that is a poster that we presented at the, it was presented at the OR Managers Conference in 2015. And so this was a six-month study in a large hospital. 
that had 19 operating rooms. And as you can see in graph number one, they started with their percent of high-touch objects cleaned pretty close to the national average, just a little bit under 30%. And over six months' time, for both between case and terminal cleaning, we were able to improve the thoroughness of cleaning and sustain it over time, which is very important. Um, it's sometimes easier to make a change. Um, it's harder to sustain that change. And any of you that are listening that have tried to improve, improve hand hygiene compliance or improve any other process know if you don't sustain that, if you don't keep it top of mind for people, if you don't provide feedback to people, um, they'll improve, but then they'll very quickly slide back to the baseline. And so this graph shows really nicely that we were able to not only improve the cleaning, but keep it, uh, keep it at that level for six months following. Graph number two is showing the room turnover times. We were able to work with this hospital, uh, with this OR staff, to decrease their room turnover time by five minutes on average. And that's a significant reduction in time. And so you can see from this that they started out with room turnover times as long as um, close to 20 minutes and toward the end we were um, having an upper limit of more like 14 and a half minutes or 13 minutes for their room turnover time. So it really made a significant difference in both thoroughness of cleaning and room turnover time. And then we have some more examples of using the same program in a couple of other situations. So in this particular case, this is a 15, this is a hospital with 15,000 annual surgeries in the northwestern part of the United States and they asked us to see how much improvement we could we could create in thoroughness of cleaning in four weeks time and you can see that they started at a baseline of about 12 percent of high touch objects cleaned week one they went up to 19 percent and then they gradually increased and after four weeks they were up to 74 percent and you know one would like to think that if they continued providing feedback to staff if they continued to monitor and and um, um, reinforce the process that they would have um, moved up to 80% and stayed there consistently because that's the results that we've seen in the past. And this is another example. This particular hospital said, gave us three days to see how, how well we could improve the thoroughness of cleaning. And in this case, this was 20,000 annual surgeries in the western part of the United States. They started with a baseline of about 21% of high touch objects cleaned. And day one, they were at 82, 80%. Then they went to 88% for day two and three. And so really quick r improvement. And really a big part of it is putting together a process for how to clean a room that's efficient and hits the high touch objects. And then clearly defining and helping people define roles and responsibilities. And so that's why you can see such rapid improvement if you implement a program like this. And so now um, I'd like to turn it over to Dawn Hughes, who's going to talk just for a couple of minutes about her experience in implementing this program. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. And it's an honor to be here to introduce this program. Um, I bring the perspective from an end user on this. So this is where I want to talk through and talk about uh, why it's such a great program and how helpful it is to those of us that have the 24 7 um, responsibility for the OR. So when you look at a program, um, what am I looking for? So what am I looking for? I'm looking for something with the 40,000 other topics that I have going on in my head, something that's easy, um, efficient, and obviously being the patient advocate, that's what my end goal is. So the beauty of the Intelligence Program is that this addresses both. Next slide. So basically how does the program meet my needs? Um, it brings a standard of work to the team. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the consistency, the positive results of the training um, as we go on. So basically, it doesn't matter. Most of us think that um, we can definitely use improvement in cleaning in our OR. Um, so what does this do? We, this brings about standard work. And this is something of a next slide. We talk about frequently. Um, we talk about high reliability, um, and we talk about uh, Less feedback. So again, standard work provides those for for what we do in our OR. It doesn't matter how long or how often we clean if we're cleaning the wrong thing. So next slide. Let's talk about consistency. Any of us that work in the OR look at a turnover, and again, because we're pushed by the metrics um, within our turnover time, um, we frequently get in with several people. Um, 
doing well with the Six Sigma and Lean, I don't get called the spaghetti diagram. I'm calling an anthill. It's a bunch of screwing, and we're not sure what each other have done. So after the implementation of the program, you have standardized work that the same person assigned to a certain swim lane does the same thing every time. So that you are sure that those high touch um, areas are hit every time. So the best example that I like to give of this is the OR bed. We, um, no matter how small or large the case, we do a wonderful job tearing down the mattresses, taking off the bumpy boards, wiping down the base, and the bed is clean. Um, how often do we touch the hand piece, which again, our friends at anesthesia are frequently making adjustments with the same uh, gloved hands that they integrate the patient with. So just again, as far as the consistency, it's not a time, but getting those high touch objects clean every time so that we don't have bio burden build up. Next slide. So how do we monitor this bio burden um, build up? One thing that we don't do well now is monitor how our rooms are clean. We kind of have the, I call them the McDonald's hourly bathroom checklist that everybody checks off, yes, everything was done every night, and it looks wonderful. But how do we know, other than having one of the staff come to us and say, there was still blood on my bed from last night, or there was, you know, some type of soil, um, we don't have a very objective way of quantifying the cleanliness in our ORs. So with the digital monitoring, it gives us very objective, super easy to use. It glows under a fluorescent light, uh, black light. You know, if it glows, it's dirty. If it doesn't glow, it's clean. Uh, puts it up into a wonderful monitoring plan for us. And it's simple for those of us that are responsible for reporting these things to the special control committee or our sensory committees. Um, I punch a button and I have a beautiful report that I can take. Go on to the next slide. So the other beautiful thing that we uh, struggle with is we never have enough bodies or never enough time to do the training that we need. What this program does is it brings a passionate team who is very well informed. Um, you've heard Linda coming from the infection control perspective. You have um, Resident experts, they come in and they're passionate about what they do. This is all that they do and they love it. So they bring a standardized format to your team. They work side by side with your team. They don't sit in a room and tell you this is how you're supposed to do it. They have scrubs on, they're in working with and showing the team how to do it. Um, and at the end of the training, I get a wonderful little packet delivered to my office with here are the competencies, here's what we did. And here's how great your team has become over this two to three day implementation time. So it's um, extremely professional. It's highly skilled. It energizes your team that's doing your turnover. And it makes everybody feel great um, knowing that we've got tangible um, and objective results that we can look at either for improvement or just to sustain how wonderful we're doing for our patients in the end. Last slide. So it's very easy for us um, at the end that are responsible for this but have a lack of resources or a lack of the right resources to be able to do this training. Next slide. Okay, great. Thanks, Don. So, yeah, you really can make a difference, and this is um, really an easy uh, way to make an improvement in your operating room thoroughness of cleaning and hopefully also potentially decrease your room turnover time. And so just to reiterate what we talked about this afternoon, we discussed the role of environmental contamination in the prevention of healthcare associated infections. We described the role of environmental contamination in the transmission of healthcare associated infections. We talked about the latest research on environmental hygiene. We covered some processes and tools to improve environmental hygiene that you may not be using today that you should consider. And then we also talked about the results of some pilot programs. We've, we've been very successful at improving environmental hygiene in the operating room. And so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention and open it up for any questions that people might have. Yeah, thank you, Linda and Don, for that informative and enjoyable presentation. And as Linda mentioned, I'll begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Um, we'll attempt to answer as many questions as we can today. 
So the first question is, how do you sell this program to the C-suite? Linda, would you like to tackle that one? Actually, Dawn, if you, you've had experience with doing that, would you be willing to, to answer that question? Absolutely. I love this question because, again, um, part of that responsibility to the OR is also for the fiscal responsibility. Um, again, in adding the program, you are not adding any costs. You're just buying the things that you're already buying anyway. What you are adding is your monitoring. And for a lot of um, facilities, it is an upgrade to the equipment or um, linen, i.e. non-linen, that you will be using going forward. So, it's, again, it's pretty cost neutral on that aspect. And then when you look at the cost of a hospital-acquired infection, we all know that these are, number one, um, difficult for a hospital, especially with reimbursements on the pay for performance, because we're not going to be paid for those patients that come back in with hospital-acquired infections. Um, and number two, when we look at the patient, which is why we're all here, the detrimental effects of having a hospital-acquired infection, um, I believe having to undergo usually a, a route of IV antibiotics, but sometimes the outcomes are very devastating. So just one AHI, if we can prevent that, um, it's well worth the cost of the program. Great. Thank you, Don. The next question is, who do you recommend do the auditing or monitoring? Okay, um, I can answer that. I think we have this type of program in, in all over in the hospital, in the patient room area, in the operating room, in clinics, emergency departments. And really, regardless of wherever that cleaning is being done and who's doing the cleaning, we always recommend that the person that's doing the monitoring be someone that's an objective outside third party. So for instance, in the operating room, that might be the OR manager or OR educator, because we want it to be an objective uh, result. And sometimes if you know you're watching your own staff, people just have a tendency to rate people a little bit better when it's their own staff or their own process than they're mon that they're monitoring, than if it's someone from the outside monitoring a process that they don't own. So again, OR manager or educator, because ultimately it's the clinical staff that's responsible for patient safety for hospital acquired infections. And it's the hospital, it's the um, OR staff that should be monitoring the thoroughness of cleaning. That makes sense. Thank you, Linda. Next question here is, can you explain in more detail the AORN guidelines and the objective monitoring and how this program meets them? Sure. Um, the AORN guidelines say that you just need to use an objective method to monitor uh, the thoroughness of cleaning. One thing that they do say specifically, though, is that uh, whatever monitoring method you're using, you should do monitoring. You should um, do monitoring before the room is cleaned and then immediately after the room is cleaned. So you have a comparison of your results for both before and after cleaning. Um, rather than just a, uh, a result from after cleaning. Um, and so this is to generate objective data and to active as it also provides feedback to the staff. So it, for instance, in the use of a fluorescent marker, you would go in before, um, after the patient leaves the room and before cleaning takes place and mark the high touch objects. After the cleaning is done, you would go back afterwards and see if those marks have been removed. And that's a very important way to know that you place the marks and then the marks are removed. If you're using a fluorescent, if you're using an ATP monitor, for instance, then you'd want to go in and take an ATP reading before cleaning and then come back in after cleaning and take another ATP reading and see that the number has gone down uh, to the level that you think is acceptable. At least that's what the AORN guidelines say, and I believe that that's also um, listed in the CDC toolkit. Perfect, thank you. Next question is, what do you recommend for auditing between procedures and terminal procedures? So our program recommends that you monitor 2.5% of the total number of procedures you do per year. So uh, for instance, if you have 12,000 surgeries per year, that would uh, result in about 15 between case audits a month and about 10 term audits a month. And that's assuming that you're doing a good uh, split between between case and terminal cleaning auditing. So we would recommend that you might clean you might audit 60% of between case between case auditing and 40% for terminal cleaning. Uh, and so that it's a 2.5% with 60/40 split. Great. Okay. Next question is: What type of product do you use on the floor between cases and for terminal cleaning? What is the dwell time, and do you use a tuber? 
I'm so sorry about this pronunciation. Yeah. It's tuberculocidal. <laughs> that's a, yeah, okay, that's a good, boy, that's a big question, actually. Uh, we get a lot of questions on what to use on the floors in the operating room, and um, I've looked at all the guidelines that are out there, and um, it doesn't specifically say what what to use, and so it really is a hospital policy to determine what you want to use. Obviously, you want something that um, has a, the quickest contact time possible. And then if you look at a, study, a published uh, review article that came out a couple of years ago by Dr. Rutala, he says whatever disinfectant or whatever disinfectant you choose, you should look at making sure that it kills the pathogens that are of most importance in your hospital. And so uh, TB isn't necessarily, and this is my uh, opinion, but it's based on some information that's out there. TB isn't necessarily the most important pathogen you should be looking to kill on surfaces because TB is an airborne infection. And once it lands on a surface, it's really not uh, transmitted easily anymore. And so um, it's really looking more at uh, disinfectants that kill bloodborne pathogens. And in fact, TB was, uh, Picking a tuberculocidal disinfectant was what we used back in the day before we had uh, disinfectants that were effective against bloodborne pathogens. And so we were trying to pick a disinfectant that was very strong and most likely to kill most organisms, and that's why we picked a tuberculocidal disinfectant. Now we have many, many disinfectants and cleaner disinfectants that are effective against HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. And so we don't any longer have to make sure that a disinfectant is tuberculocidal in order to kill the pathogens that are most important to us in healthcare. Great, thank you, Linda. The next question is, um, where do you get the fluorescent markers that you've described? Ah, that's a good question. And so we, we looked at um, the published studies that are out there at which objects are touched the most often, and we also aligned with AORN's recommended practice for high-touch objects. And so that's how we determined which high-touch objects to mark. Um, and I don't know if I want to list them all here on the phone, but we're starting with, you know, the lights, the table, um, the restraint strap, if it's a reusable restraint strap, the table controls, and then we go around the periphery of the room and we mark objects that are likely to be touched between cases. So it might be the cabinet handles, it might be mobile medical equipment that was used between cases. Uh, and so there are a variety of things that we look at, but it's basically focused on what the evidence has told us that the high-touch objects are that we should pay the most attention to. Perfect. Thank you. I am pulling up the next question. Are you recommending that the microfiber cloths be soaked in solution versus spray? That's a good question, too. And honestly, um, AORN has come out and said that you really shouldn't aerosolize uh, disinfectants, um, and in fact, I think OSHA might actually also have a statement on that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, don't quote me on that. Um, it's just been determined that you shouldn't aerosolize, so you shouldn't spray disinfectants, and that's just from a um, aerosolizing and a patient impact st standpoint. Um, it's also harder to get the right amount of disinfectant on a surface when you're spraying. People maybe tend to not spray as much as they should. And so saturating a cloth or taking a pre-saturated cloth of some kind, whether it's a wiper or a, or a cloth that's saturated in disinfectant, is a better way to make sure that you, c you clean the entire surface and that you meet the contact time. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, have you looked at supplementing cleaning procedures with hydrogen peroxide fog or UV decontamination machines? Hmm. Definitely a hot topic, um, that's for sure. And um, all I'll say is that those, uh, those different devices that are out there today are very much of interest to people, and they are showing that they do create some log reduction of bacteria. Um, but they're never going to replace. And so the question is well well stated because it says, are you going to ever consider supplementing? Because cleaning and disinfection is never going to go away. We're always going to have to manually remove organic material and, and manual, manually clean surfaces and disinfect surfaces. And then it's possible as more studies become available that people might also begin to use um, newer technologies such as UV um, or hydrogen peroxide vapor for an additional cleaning. Great, that makes sense. 
Linda, the next question is, how well does the program work in a multidisciplinary cleaning program where the cleaning responsibilities are split between several different individuals under different leadership? Yeah, that's, you're bringing up a really good question. Um, and we have worked with situations like that. And I think the, the really important thing to do, and it has been very effective for us, is to be really clear about people's roles and responsibilities up front so that everyone knows what everyone else is supposed to be doing and everyone agrees to that up front. And if you've done that, then this kind of program can work perfectly because the program itself is really just based on best practices and best tools and training, and that can be applied to any, any discipline. It's just being really clear and working with the teams to be clear on who does what. Great, thank you. The next question is, do you explain the 60-40 split again? Oh, sure. I didn't do a very good job of that. So the idea is that if you were going to be auditing 2.5% of your annual procedures and you had a 12,000 annual surgeries, the idea would be that you would want to have 60% of your audits be on between case cleaning and 40% be on terminal cleaning, just to have a good representation of both of those types of cleaning because they're very different. So that's the that's the what the point I was trying to make earlier. Whatever percentage of your procedures that you're doing, 60% of those should be between case we recommend and 40% would be terminal cleaning. Perfect. Thanks Linda um, for that clarification. The next question is um, you discussed microfiber cloths. What about clotting for those of us using clot cleaners? I didn't quite it kind of broke up a little bit. Can you just repeat oh, the I'm last sorry. part again? Sure thing. What about what using about? quat binding for those of us using quat cleaners? Okay, so quat absorption is a phenomenon that happens if you're using cotton cloth specifically with quats. And so it's, there have been some studies that have shown that um, cotton cloths, when they're dipped into quaternary ammonium disinfectants, will hold on to, will bind with the quat and hold on to it so that there's less quat available to be released onto surfaces. And so it would be important whatever um, whatever microfiber you choose that you make sure that it does not have that cotton component of it that's going to create quat um, absorption. To my knowledge, Great. disposable Thank microfiber you. cloths don't, don't have that issue. Okay. Great. Um, the next question, are the markers, the fluorescent markers, just highlighters? It's a fluorescent gel in an applicator, and it's a one use only for one single room. So it's an applicator um, with a sponge at the bottom that's specifically de designed for environmental marking. So it's a patented uh, technology that you use to go in and mark surfaces. And then it's, it's a sort of a water-based gel, so it's very easily removed when you clean a surface. Uh, and so it's a really good surrogate marker for removal of organic material from surfaces. Great. Okay. The next question is who cleans? Oh, can I can um, I go back and clarify oh. a little bit? So yeah, in addition to go for it. yeah, so in addition to the fluorescent marker gel and the black light that you use to read that, this particular monitoring method then um, has an app on um, an iOS device such as an iPod or an iPhone, and you can then mark your results into the app, and then those results are wirelessly transmitted to a secure website. And from that secure website, you can then generate reports specifically to give feedback to your staff. And so it's a marker with a black light, it has an app, and it has a secure portal for your data, and then it has reporting capability. So that's what the entire um, environmental monitoring program is. Great, thank you. Sorry I cut you off there earlier. Um, Sorry about that. Okay. I am pulling up the next question. Um, who cleans the after-hour cases? Oh, well, I'm, that, that varies, I'm sure, from facility to facility. Um, I think oftentimes it is environmental services staff. It could be an external building contractor service that comes in and does that cleaning. Um, Oftentimes we see that there is OR staff that's cleaning between cases and then there's environmental services staff that's doing the terminal cleaning. Perfect. The question is where are you purchasing the sweep sets that you described? So those sweep sets are part of this Ecolab um, 
program that we have, and so it's a it's an Ecolab product. You can talk to your account executive about that. Perfect. Okay. Another question about the fluorescent marker. Do you give credit if a partial smear is left reading with the light? That's a good question too. And we um, always recommend that you have a complete removal of the mark because the mark is easy to remove. Um, and so if a person actually physically cleaned that surface, that mark should be gone. And so we either say pass or fail. And if we see any fluorescence at all, we recommend to call it a fail because it's easy to remove. Interesting. Great. Well, Linda and audience, we are out of time. I want to thank our presenters for the excellent presentation and for everyone for participating today in the question and answer session. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. This concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.